So have you ever been defined by the way that people perceive you? By the way you look, by your profession? Even your name can be thought of as a label or a stereotype. But what I believe truly defines us is what's in our mind and our actions. What we do and what we think, they're connections that we make very early on in our life. I know for a fact my family started calling those specific moments for me Shelly Mind moments. And I come from a family of two very dedicated scientists, my parents. They have extremely different personalities, though, don't get me wrong, but they've always complimented each other in some bizarre way. And that is exactly how my older sister and I have been ever since the day I was born till the day she recently left for college. We are the epitome of yin and yang. And also, ever since I was young, I was always encouraged to look at the world from my personal point of view so that I would be able to define my own idea of success as I grew up, and also to dream inside the innate curiosity that I know we all have within us. This actually reminds me of a point when I was really young. I was a youngin. I was probably like four or five years old. And I looked up at my dad and I asked him, why is the sky blue, daddy? Now I know a lot of you dads out there would have simply responded with, maybe just because, or maybe some of you sly dads would have asked your child to ask their mom. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad proceeded to explain the whole science behind why the sky was blue. Now, did I know exactly what he was talking about? No. But I still remember looking up at that big sky and thinking about how absolutely beautiful it was. Now, as I grew up, I observed my own sister in her scientific studies, but I realized that I perceived things differently. What I really noticed was the beauty behind the science. But there were still so many things that were unknown to me, so many things that I had to learn. But honestly, I was never afraid of not knowing, and I always embraced my imagination without any barriers or stereotypes. And that's actually what led me to my scientific journey. So when the movie Inception came out in theaters, my family and I, we went to go see the movie, and afterwards we came home and we were having a pretty casual, I guess, family dinner. And my parents and my older sister, they started talking about the different dimensions of things, but the dimensions of things that you can physically touch or feel. And I was thinking to myself, well, what about the dimensions of things that you can't physically touch or feel? Like, what about the dimensions of dreams or emotions in general? So why was I interested in this? Because the way we perceive things depends on how we feel. Like, have you ever noticed when you're really sad, maybe depressed, you feel as though every hour is like an eternity, but when you're really happy or upbeat, you feel as though time passes in an instance. Well, that same perceptional experience occurs when we listen to music. That's actually the basis of music therapy. Now, when I realized this, I had what my parents and my older sister described as a Shelley mind moment. I began researching, and I came across the term fractal dimension. Now, fractal dimension, it's the complexity or the self-similarity of a data set, how complicated it is. My particular data set was music. So this would be an example of low fractal dimension music, low complexity music. As you can tell, it's very repetitive, very er, calming. And then when you get to a higher complexity music, mid-range fractal dimension, it becomes more complex. And then when you get to very high fractal dimension music, excuse me, it becomes so complex that it's chaotic. But why and how do music and sounds induce different emotions and perceptions of time? That was the purpose of my research study that I began four years ago, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Now, when I began this, I knew, I knew for a fact it was not going to be an easy task. It was gonna take probably years and years to accomplish. And I can assure you that I did fail so many times, but every time I did, I reminded myself that I was one step closer to success because there are no mistakes and only lessons. And also over the years, I developed a process or a protocol to really understand why does the brain respond to different audio stimuli. Now I tested about 100 people and I tested each with 
a little bit less than 30 music clips. And what I found was that when we listen to low complexity music and sounds, the majority of electrical activity that we have is actually on the left hemisphere of our brain. So what we feel is a positive emotion, like joy. But when we listen to high complexity music and sounds, the majority of electrical activity that we have is on the, left, or the right hemisphere of our brain. So what we feel is a negative emotion, like fear. So this shows that the nervous system actually understands dimensionality in music, and that different audio stimuli does induce different emotions and perceptions of time. So what this brings is an entirely new foundation to music therapy. It could help people who suffer from anxiety, from depression, even from post-traumatic stress disorder. So this would be a mathematical correlation, pretty much showing that all the various factors of my research, they're connected in some way. However, I feel that the simplicity of portraying my research in one unique image is all the more powerful. It can even be thought of as art. So what this is showing is that when we listen to low complexity music, or low fractal dimension music, we feel joy, and we feel as though time is shorter than it actually is. But when we listen to high complexity music, high fractal dimension music, we feel fear, and we feel as though time is longer than it actually is. So while thinking about simplicity, I also realized that by looking for collaborative opportunities is also where you find your real role models. An example would be Scott Kim and John Langdon. Scott Kim, he is a computer scientist from California, and he's dedicated his time to the creation of different games and ambigrams. John Langdon has also dedicated his career to the creation of ambigrams. And one of his most famous pieces is actually from the sequel to The Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons. He created the ambigram for the Illuminati. Very cool stuff. So I collaborated with both these men to show you that there really isn't a separation between science and art. They're actually embedded within each other. Now, a lot of people seem to think that science, it's only in black and white. It's really logical. It's really rational. But the point is that there's great importance in adding color and adding life and adding personality to science. And also not to forget to stretch your imagination. And all you have to do is realize that maybe art is in the reflection of science. And also to remember, that the real joy is in the journey of asking questions because everything else is a destination. And that's actually why I asked myself, so how can I apply this connection between science and the arts to an amazing cause? And that's when I learned about Rockets for the Cure. So two teenagers named Dylan and Sanzio, they broke the Guinness World Record by launching 4,000 model rockets simultaneously. Cool, right? So what they were pretty much going to do was they were going to do like a rectangular format. It's been done before and it's well known. So I thought to myself, how can I make this a visual art experience for everyone? So we actually made it a circular format and we used infrared cameras and thermal imaging to make it a visual art experience. So the modeling was a really important part of this process because if you have um, a few measurements that are off, it could impact the entire launch itself and then the scattering and whatnot. And so the uh, diameter of the circle is really important and that was with the help of Dr. Fernandez from Georgia Tech to figure out that the diameter had to be um, 88 feet. And then the wind speed also played a role in the scattering, so it had to be less than 10 miles per hour. So basically a heat signature is just when heat leaves its mark. When the rockets are on the ground and they go through combustion, it leaves a heat signature. And also when they're in the air, it leaves a heat signature too. When they explode, that actually is like the peak of heat. And so with the help of infrared cameras and thermal imaging, you can see this donut kind of appearance. So it would be um, a heat gradient over the original ring on the ground. So that would be the art, artistic part of the whole process. So Rebecca Common, a Virginia artist, as well as Dr. Peter Snyder from Brown University and the Rhode Island School of Design, he is a neuroscientist, are amazing examples of how art can be created as well as inspired by science. 
And that's also why I chose an image from Rockets for the Cure. And from the image, it can also be represented as neurons firing together. And that's why I named it after them, Considerate Neural. <laughs> so by now, I think that we can agree that the only place where science meets the arts is outside of the box. And that, unlike what a lot of people think, an idea is not just a single flash or eureka moment. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It actually is a diverse network of fluid knowledge. So how can I simplify what I've been doing for the last four years in one unique experience for you guys? How can I show you that although science and the arts might be a yin and yang contrast, that it's actually a unification? How can I make you all a part of my dream. I have an experimental film for you guys, and it's been done with infrared cameras and drones, as well as music written specifically for the film, showing that fractal dimension is consistent with music and our emotions. So, I chose to use something that I'm sure we're all familiar with in the Richmond, Virginia area. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with seeing James River, but here are the emotional dimensions of the James River. I want to invite you all to join me on the exploration to where science meets the arts. Thank you very much. 